Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Like Scott mentioned, this is an important decision for the, the city of Edina. And a lot has came, has went into this. This is a process that started in 2018 with the fire station study, concluded with that recommendation in 2019. Um, a little bit just quickly about me. I started with the city of Edina in 2013. I left in 2018 to took a, take a different position in another city and came back in July of 2021. And that's kind of where we picked up this process. As we, we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, there's, there's a gap in there, and that gap we call COVID-19, where that kind of challenged every single one of us in one way or another, and still challenges us to today. And that is uh, an important part of this process as we talk about the background here. We're gonna start with who we are, what we are today, and, and how we got here to, 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 this, to the room that we're all sitting in here today. So how do we get here? Uh, in 2017, we talked about that evaluating that performance and locations of fire and emergency services for the city of Edina. Uh, we, we consulted a study. Five Bugles was an architect firm that, that performed a study for us. And we asked these study questions. Are we serving the public in a timely manner? Are the facilities adequate or do they need to be expanded or replaced? And how can we best serve the public in the future? How do traffic patterns affect response times? So that five bugles is an architect and a, and a firm, a study firm that prepared a report that was, uh, was communicated to city council in the city in 2019. 2021, we had a fire operations town talk and that's a, a conversation that myself and Chief Fisher led where we talked about where we were in the process, kind of reminded everyone about what happened in 2019. In 2022, there was a council work session that we brought the site finalists, and, and we'll talk about those finalists here today, to city council. Because there was a real estate transaction involved with that, and um, being able to re have the city remain in a, uh, not putting themselves in a position to tell the, the owners of either site about the real estate transaction, we wanna make sure that that was a closed work session so that we could still have a competitive process and not, not advise the owners that the city was, uh, was in the process. The current stations are Station 1, which is at 6250 Tracy Avenue. The station was constructed and remodeled in 2008. It's 34,000 square feet. It serves the, the city of Edina residents with our fire administration, so all of our chief officer staff office out of Station 1. Um, we have two ambulances staffed 24 seven out of station one with two paramedic firefighters on each ambulance. There's one fire engine that's staffed out of station one with a minimum of three. There's three different shifts that have 11 firefighters on them, minimums of nine. So every single day, 24 seven, there's nine paramedic firefighters uh, uh, at this station and station two. And they're serving the call volume that we currently have in the city. Station two, is at 73rd and York. The station was originally constructed to be a, a uh, what we would call a power truck station where it was only going to be daytime staffing. At nighttime, the, the crews would close down and the, and the station would remain empty at night. Call volume continued to increase in the southeast quadrant and the station was remodeled to include staff quarters for two paramedic firefighters. To this day, station two, our busiest quadrant in the city is staffed with one ambulance with two paramedic firefighters in it. Um, part of the study was looking at that, that space needs and, and what kind of needs we would have to serve that current call volume. This is where we talk about the study. So the five bugles or the, the firm that did the study reviewed three years of data that went into this. And um, we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but fire calls are on the left and the red side. EMS calls are on the right. And this is what we call a heat map where the more concentrated the volume, the darker the color. The city is split up into quadrants. You'll hear me reference the southeast quadrant many times throughout this presentation. It's split up by Highway 100 and Highway 62 into the northeast, the northwest, the southeast, and the southwest quadrants. You'll notice in both of these a large call volume increase in the southeast quadrant. We have additional hot spots in areas of high population, which follows that high population and call volume based on the occupancy. Uh, this is a review of our current call data. So 2021 until year to day. So until today, our fire calls on the left, 
you can see there's an increased call volume uh, when we start getting some red spots in this heat map, but the fire call volume is, is spread out pretty evenly throughout the city. EMS call volume is a different story. The EMS call volume is very heavy in the southeast quadrant, as can be expected with the occupancies that exist in the southeast quadrant with many high rises, uh, senior living, and hospitals and clinic facilities that are in that quadrant. This uh, again is another look at all of the calls that existed in the city of Edina from 2021 to year to date. You can see the graph here that shows the, the call volume in the southeast quadrant and the disparity that takes place with the large call volume. That again is staffed with one ambulance in that quadrant due to the space of station two. The recommendations of that study were to keep station one in its current location. They re recommended constructing a new station two near the southwest corner of the Southdale Center and plan for continued growth in the northeast quadrant anticipating in five to 10 years from 2019 that we would need to build a third station somewhere near City Hall campus to, to accommodate the call volume. Uh, we've had some discussion about the southwest corner of the Southdale Center and we call that kind of ground zero. That is where if that site was available, that is the highest, highest responding site. It performs the best throughout the entire community. And that's why that was identified as kind of ground zero that we should try to find a spot as close to that as possible. Now we get into site selection. And one of the things that we wanted to look at were what factors go into a site selection. I think many of us here may have a, a, a different view of how we, decide, how we decide where the fire station should be located. And we had to set some factors for how we, what we concluded in our site selection. These factors were response times to the entire community, that two to four acres is optimal for fire station design due to the large apparatus and, and the needs for the fire station, that fire department operations were the priority for site flow. As we talk about developing and developments around that, we wanted to make sure that fire department operations would not be affected with developments either near or with the fire station. We had to anticipate future growth for the community. We had to anticipate future needs of the department. We call it future proofing, where we're trying to anticipate what those needs were um, we, and try to forecast how we can still serve the community. The worst thing we could do is construct a new facility and come back in two years and say it's not big enough to, to address the needs. So we want to future proof that station. One of the things the fire department has the, the public health division within the fire department umbrella. Currently they're staffed out of city hall and we, are, we want to incorporate the public health division into the fire station to increase the collaboration, to become proactive rather than reactive. The emergency response is a response to a problem that currently exists. One of the collaboration efforts that we believe we can take place with putting public health and the fire station uh, together is creating that proactive response where we can identify problems and start getting ahead of them with education and resources through the public health division. So station two would incorporate that public health administration and offices and spaces for the public health division and the residents that would, that would receive resources from public health. One thing that I think we can all appreciate is a community landmark that exists with a fire station. This is a safe space, a place that everyone from child to our oldest resident recognizes, and we want to be able to create that community landmark for the city of Edina. This site selection review process was thorough. There were 27 different sites evaluated throughout this process. The review criteria included parcel size, availability, the response, the response times, and then the fire department operations are priority. As we identify, there are different sites that had other developments that were trying to develop at the same time, but fire department operations would, be would, would not be priority, therefore it made it challenging to try to design a fire station. Um, the availability was an important factor for us. We wanted to make sure that the, the site was available and that, that can be a challenge as, the, as different sites come on and off the market. Ultimately, two sites were identified in this, as finalists and those are the sites we're gonna discuss tonight. What's the importance of response times? And I think that that's one of the things that is probably the most important in this decision. When there's a fire at our house, a fire doubles in size every minute 
from the time we identify it till the time that that fire truck and those apparatus and staff show up, this fire is doubling in size, destroying properties, and, and creating a risk for, the, for not only the occupants, but nearby residents, and furthermore, the entire neighborhood. Smoke damage. Even if we have a fire that goes out, we still deal with smoke, and firefighters are equipped to, to mitigate that smoke and reduce the damage inside the structure. We have sprinklers in many facilities now, even home sprinklers. One of the challenges is after the fire is extinguished, most of our residents and building owners and building tenants don't know how to shut off the sprinkler system, so water continues to flow until firefighters are arriving and able to shut down and mitigate that problem. And then rescue. If there's a car crash, traffic on the highway, our firefighters respond and start, start responding to that problem. I like to talk about when there's a problem, whether that is uh, I'm working on my house and I break a plumbing line and water starts going everywhere, response time is the only thing that repairs this problem. If I don't have the capability of taking care of this myself, I can only depend on how fast I can get someone who's trained, equipped, and prepared to tackle that problem because during that time, all I have is anxiety, stress, and this problem continuing. And that exists with fire calls. Also for EMS calls, uh, as we noted, EMS calls are a large call volume. Almost 90% of our calls in the city of Edina were EMS related. Seven to 10% survival reduction time per minute in a cardiac arrest. And we have to remember, I, I've just advised a group of people that if I were to go down right now, there's a certain period of time that's gonna take for all of us to recognize that there's an actual problem. And so that time, that's where we start the clock. And then after we identify, we call 911 and we collect that information. The 911 dispatchers do a fantastic job, but there's still time to collect the information and, and have the appropriate facilities or resources respond. Then we have response time, that drive time from that station, the location of that apparatus to your home or the place that the medical emergency is taking place. And then our responders go into the building if we're talking about a high-rise building, we have to talk about how much time it would take to move through the building as well. In a single-family house, when an ambulance pulls up to the driveway, there's an immediate sense of relief that help is there and, this, and the problem will begin to be solved. When we arrive to a high-rise building, we may have to go up 12, 13 stories and that time clock continues to tick towards a patient that is suffering a medical emergency. This takes place in stroke, trauma, difficulty breathing. So when we talk about response time, it's important to remember it's not just for fires, it's for any emergency that exists in the city of Edina, that period of time at which it takes us to respond to the home and start mitigating the problem. The 2021 Southeast Quadrant responses. So there were 3,093 responses in 2021 and we broke those down by daytime and nighttime responses. I think one of the, the biggest challenges is understanding that there is impact of sirens, lights, and apparatus with the fire station. It's a critical service that I don't believe anyone in this room is questioning that we need. We're just wondering what that impact may be on us. So we talked about, break, we broke down the calls from daytime and nighttime responses and sirens authorized versus no sirens. When the dispatchers take that information, they advise us if it's a non-emergent run, which means we drive normally with no lights and sirens. There were 1,025 non-emergent runs in 2021. This means we drove just like we all do in our personal vehicles to the emergency. This could be a fall, a lift assist with no injuries where we don't have the authorization to go lights and sirens. Now we talk about the emergency runs. In 2021, there were 2,068 runs that constitute an emergent response. And I say constituted because our lights and sirens are meant to move traffic. They're meant to get to an emergency expeditiously so that we can get there safely. We can warn people that we're coming and to stay out of the way and to clear the roadway. There were 597 emergency sirens authorized responses from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. in 2021. This results in about 1.63 responses per day. I'll remind everyone that after hours, there is not traffic on the road. Right now, if we all think about our personal situations, 
there still existed all these calls in this quadrant, all throughout this southeast quadrant, but we don't use lights and sirens for every single emergency response. If there's no traffic to move, we can, we can respond to this in the same speed, and lights and sirens actually bring on problems going through neighborhoods, attracting things, attracting views, and lights and siren driving is a challenge because of uh, warning drivers. And so at the, in the middle of the night, you don't hear these lights and sirens. There may be lights on, but staff does not have to use a siren to move traffic out of the way. So the, the emergency constituted it. If there was traffic on the road, we could move them out of the way. But if there's no traffic, we just respond routine to that, even though it constituted an emergency response. When we talk about fire station impact, we all want to know what kind of impact exists for each one of our individual situations. And I like to talk about the fixed factors and variable factors of a fire station impact. That's the station location. Once we build a station, once we identify the location of the station, that becomes a fixed factor. We know where that station is and we know how far we are away from that station. That drive time to the emergency becomes a fixed factor once we know what that address is, we know where the station is, we know what that fixed response time or drive time is gonna be. We talk about the response profile. We know that a specific set of emergencies will constitute an emergency response and we know what constitutes a non-emergent response. The emergency lights and sirens will come with the fire station. They do exist. We do have to respond with emergency lights and sirens throughout the day and evening and night. And it is a critical service that we all need to provide for public safety. The variable factors include the call volume, the number of calls that we go. We don't know, we can base that off of historic data, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Or furthermore, in the next five minutes, how many calls will take place. So we use past data to predict what the future, what the future may look like, but that is a variable factor. We don't know what that call volume will exactly be. We also don't know what time the emergency will take place, what type of emergency will take place, or the location of that emergency. That may vary based on where this takes place. And we can't tell you what the traffic will be based on all these variable factors. What comes with the fire station for community opportunities? We talked about it earlier as this community landmark. It's a publicly accessible safe space. Um, I know my children know that a fire station is a safe space. If they ever have a time in need, if they need to go somewhere where they know they can depend on somebody, they go to a fire station. There's public health initiatives that we spoke about with putting public health in this fire station. That creates public health initiatives that we can program out of the fire station. Collaboration with other city programming. Tonight we're at the public works facility. The fire station would include a training room, a community room that could be used for collaboration throughout park programming, other city programs, or programs where neighborhoods could have access to, the, to these facilities with meeting and class space. The two-way relationship with the community. This is a place, this is your fire station. This is a place where you can come have interaction and take place with that building and, uh, and access the building and, and the people that are inside of it. The safety and outreach training with fire prevention, blood pressure checks, group tours of that facility come with the fire station. One that every kindergarten looks forward to. Forward to. Now we talk about the site finalists. The work session in 2022 brought three site finalists. 66 in Valley View Drive or the parking lot of Roslyn Park, 4401 76 Street West, and 7250 France Avenue was discussed. The 7250 France Avenue was ultimately eliminated due to the operational challenges that existed with the, the adjoining developments. So 7250 France was struck, struck from the table, leaving us with two finalists. The two sites that we'll talk about on the maps here as we break out with staff later are 66 and Valley View. This is an aerial of 66 and Valley View, which is next to Roslyn Park in the parking lot. It has access to 62 and 100 for a, a response time and the highest performance response time to the entire community. We can access the southern part of Southeast Quadrant by taking Valley View around, missing the South Hill traffic and congestion and we can access all parts of the southeast quadrant quickly. 4401 76th Street West is an eight acre parcel off 76th Street. Uh, this site performs well as it also performs well. 
It doesn't perform as well when compared to 66 in Valley View, but it still has great access to the southeast quadrant. It is more south than 66 in Valley View, so times to the north are, are um, increased. However, there are some performance increases that take place regardless of the site, and we'll talk about those in the response time maps. The response time comparison. This is a comparison of the three different sites. Station one being the standalone, staying in its place at 6250 and Tracy Avenue. And station two, in its current location, breaking down the call, the percentage of response time. This is drive time, actual road drive time to each location. So you can see uh, the current stations on top, the 76th Street location in the middle, and the 66 and Valley View site. We talk about a, a comp plan goal of a six minute or less response time. And so we totaled each response time for the entire city for six minutes or less. And we talk about why 1% is a big deal. I think when we all look at just a number, we talk about 1% doesn't mean much. Why is that important? But if we talk about 1% in the terms of a neighbor, it's a different story. We talk about that 1% that's going to go from a four to a, a six minute response to an eight minute response, and we're talking about our neighbor, it's a little bit harder to say we shouldn't care about that 1%. So the recommendations that we talk about is making sure that we're performing to the entire city as we look at response time. Now there are differences throughout these that we evaluate and we'll go into that. This again is a city quadrant split by Highway 62 and Highway 100. So the, the different quadrants and how they perform. This is our population. Each one of these dots represents one person. The dots that are more collected are stacked up. You can see in the southeast quadrant that density is greater. And um, just as a reminder, this isn't the exact location of each resident, but just one, one resident per city block in this area that are scattered throughout the city block. So you can see uh, our population in the southeast quadrant, some of the other areas where our highest call volume exists as we transition to the next slide, which will be call volume. This is that call density that we show with our 2021 and 20 to 2022 data and our current call density with each one of those dots representing one call and the density that's taking place in the southeast quadrant. If we transition to the 4401 76th Street West site, this dark blue is zero to two minute drive time. That is if I leave the fire station and drive for two minutes, I could reach by way of road and different, different roads, the following areas in zero to two minutes, that outline in this dark blue. So you can see our south, by moving this to 76th Street, some of that response time, that zero to two minutes, does go into the adjoining neighborhoods or the neighborhood, neighboring communities. But this, this site still performs well to the majority of the city. It performs well to the highest volume in the southeast quadrant. As we transition to 66 and Valley View, again, we talk about, I, I didn't do a great job explaining, zero to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight, and eight to 10 in the dark orange. And we have handouts and, and these available on our website to look at a little bit deeper. It's hard on the, uh, on the screen here. We can talk about this individually later if, if anyone has questions. But as we move this response time, as we move the station location, the response time moves with it. This is based on a two station model that we're talking about right now. As we transition back to how this might look, we would have to prepare uh, an entire design for this. We're in the site selection phase, so we haven't moved to a, a design process, but initial preliminary discussions of a site fit would be a fire station located in the most northeast corner of that parking lot with apparatus exiting and entering off of Valley View Drive. The road would stay in place to still continue accessing the, the back parking lot and this fire station would be separate from the park. So there would, be, um, there would be a roadway in place keeping the fire station lot separate for safety reasons. A parking ramp would be necessary. There's currently 232 parking stalls in this parking lot. The parking ramp would have to accommodate 232 or more spaces to ensure that we don't reduce parking on this busy site. The parking ramp would have access um, off of 
Valley View or 66th Street, again, a traffic study would have to be performed to indicate what the best access and exit from that parking ramp would be. When we transition to 44176 Street West, we talked about this being an eight acre parcel. The southernmost portion of this parcel has a current wetlands, which would be not buildable, or, or stormwater collection area. And there's landfill concerns on the southernmost portion of this site. But that still re remains a relatively large site that currently has a non-occupied office building on it. That office building would have to be removed to, to, re to build a fire station. And as we mentioned, two to four acres would be optimal. So if we were to move forward with this site, we would want a design that could accommodate two to four acres, um, but the large parcel provides other opportunities for that site. The conclusions that we have today are the Southeast Quadrant development continues. We continue to having development, we continue to have more residents in that Southeast Quadrant. There's advantages and challenges of each site. The no site is perfect. We found that out through the, through the review process and there's advantages and challenges that exist with each one. Opportunities exist with each one, whether that's opportunities to increase a community space, park programming, um, or other opportunities that exist with, with the design process of either of these sites. The timeline remains important. In 2019, the study was recommended and he, we are currently in 2022. We've had a worldwide pandemic with shipping, uh, shipping concerns, construction costs, continuing, continuing to increase construction delays. So that timeline becomes very important because as we mentioned, we have just one ambulance in that Southeast quadrant right now. So all of that call volume has responses coming from station one to assist on every fire response. Anytime medic two or our ambulance in the station two area is out on a medical, the response vehicles have to come from station one responding to that southeast quadrant, putting them out of position. The fixed factors and variable factors are, are different on each site. Once we identify the, that site, we know those fixed factors will exist. The variable factors will continue to be variable regardless of the site. What are our next steps? We talked about the city council work session that took place on February 2nd. Today at the city council work session, the city council advised staff that we, they needed to collect neighborhood feedback on both sites. We uh, created this neighborhood meeting. We put the Better Together Edina site up so that we can engage neighborhoods, re receive feedback on both of these sites, and collecting site selection comments through April 15th. The next date where we sit today is March 31st. That's where we all are in this room as a neighborhood meeting. And then May 4th will be a city council presentation where we will gather all the feedback, the comments, all of the fixed factors and variable factors for a final site recommendation to city council on May 4th. The staff recommendation is gonna include the advantages and disadvantages of both sites. What infrastructure updates would be required of those sites? The programming that could or couldn't take place on each site. We have an evaluation of the city's values, including race, equity, engagement, health, sustainability, and other values that the city uh, the, the values that the city wants to review each site to ensure it meets the city's values. There has to be an environmental evaluation that would be considered as part of this recommendation. The budget goals, the response time to the entire community, and, and the neighborhood feedback that we collect through this process. So with that, that closes our presentation. I know that was a lot of information and we can, we can continue talking about this. All this information and this presentation will be posted to the Better Together site. 